On behalf of the Africa Club at London Business School, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for coming today. We appreciate that coming this early on a Saturday morning isn't the easiest thing to do, so we're definitely grateful that you all came to support what we want to do here today. I'm the co-chair of the, of the conference today, and I'd like to introduce you to our dean, who's going to give the opening remarks. And so I'd like everyone to welcome Sir Andrew Leakerman to the stage. Thank you very much indeed. And it's my very great pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful Saturday morning. I know this conference must be important if you're here. I can see where the priorities lie. Um, I'm particularly pleased to welcome back a number of alumni. I've already met some uh, during, the, during the early part of today. Um, and you know, it's great to see you, see you back. Um, this theme today, which I know has drawn you business in Africa, new perspectives for a new decade, is of course going to focus on solutions. The London Business School is about solutions. It's not about, about problems. It's about identifying problems and then looking at solutions um, in terms of meeting Africa's challenges over the next decade, obviously following year, a number of years of strong growth. Um, the key question, obviously, is how to harness uh, this growth in terms of the, the regions uh, and the continent's future development. Um, I must tell you, by the way, that um, you know, this conference sold out. The fact that there are some empty places uh, does not indicate lack of interest. On the contrary, it, it, it uh, indicates lateness of arrival um, in terms of, I uh, think, because I, mean, what, I, I mention that simply because the conference sold out on Thursday and, and a number of people then had to be turned away, and it just indicates to me how much interest there is, obviously, in, in, in what we're discussing during the course of, of today. Um, in terms of the London Business School's involvement with, with Africa, uh, this is a very, uh, this is an increasingly important continent for us. We've got about 700 alumni um, from, the from the continent, of, wh of whom about 500 are living uh, in African countries. Um, and just to be clear about the context here, um, we have at the moment uh, students from 103 countries on campus in our various programs. We've got faculty from over 30 countries. Um, and that indicates that for us, Africa is part of our worldwide reach. I looked up before I came where we have current students from. Algeria, Côte d'Ivoire, Egypt, Ghana, Kenya, Morocco, Nigeria, South Africa, Sudan, Tunisia, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. Um, and the number of students from Africa is increasing all the time. I must also tell you, by the way, that we are seeking to increase the number of students coming from Africa. And can I just put a little plug in here? Because I'm always interested in finding scholarships for people to come from Africa, you know, come from who wouldn't be able to come to London because the costs are so expensive. We all know that here. Um, so if anybody is minded, is moved as a result of today, or knows people who are interested in helping people to come from the continent, we're always pleased to hear from them because this is for us something that's really important. Of course, we can get, you know, we can fill the programs from from more developed countries very often, but we'd love to get people, more people in from more, more parts of the, of the continent. Um, we're also very proud in terms of our governing body. We have Mo Ibrahim. Uh, Mo, as you may know, is the founder, is the, uh, it, uh, set up the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, and his remit is to support African leadership, um, and he indeed is a uh, donor to us and helps us in terms of our presence on the continent. Um, we're delighted and, and honored that he's, he's one of our governing body. Um, in terms of uh, today, we're also very lucky to receive support from a number of organizations. And it, together with the scholarships, um, you know, the, the number of people supporting our efforts in Africa is increasing all the time. Uh, I should also say, for those um, who, who might wonder, you know, are we as a school involved intellectually and in terms of management in the continent, one of my colleagues spent a number of weeks in Kenya with the Maasai and observed lessons in leadership, which he's used since then as, as one aspect of the kind of on the, very much on the ground, almost literally, um, case study development. Uh, two of my colleagues, John Mullins and John Bates from marketing and, and uh, strategy, um, have uh, recently led a, uh, a program for the Young President Association in Cape Town and has done, have done, they've done case studies on both South, South Africa and Zimbabwe. Um, and we've also provided mentoring to uh, the United States International University in Nairobi, Kenya. So these are some of the things we're doing. Institute for Private Equity is involved there. 
uh, our business bridge initiative is involved there too. So lots of things. And one final link I should mention, which is uh, the Malachi Kids UK. This is a charity founded by two alumni who graduated in 1978. And this offers support to orphan children in Tanzania. Um, and that is something, again, we're very proud to be associated with. And it's about the way we as a school seek not just to improve the world of business, but also improve the lives of people in whatever way we can. Um, I, I won't go on because you haven't come here to me, hear me, you've come here uh, for the substance of, of the day. I'm sorry, by the way, that I can't be with you today, but I've got uh, something else going on in another part of the school. We'll have to go back and, uh, and uh, get it. I'm chairing that uh, in a few minutes. Um, but can I just, first of all, thank everybody who helped to make today possible. The organizers done a fantastic job in getting the day together and in getting this huge level of support, which we're absolutely delighted with. And Africa Day is a very important day for us, and I've been very pleased to see that the Africa Day develop over the years, and, you know, it's become very much you know, an, an integral part of, of what London Business School is. Finally, also, may I just thank our sponsors who are, are up here, and, and very much uh, our speakers and panelists who have come to make their contributions. Thank you again for coming. Please have a very, very enjoyable and interesting day, and welcome again to London Business School. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sir Andrew. Our next speaker actually needs no introduction. He actually came in all the way from New York to speak at this conference. He's a graduate of Oxford University and Harvard Business School, and he's actually most famous in the United Kingdom as being as the Nigerian who actually purchased Gatwick Airport. He used, to be, he used to run investment banking at Credit Suisse. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to present to you Mr. Bayo Ogunleji. Thank you, uh, Dean. I did not have the good fortune to attend London Business School, so I will try and uh, live up to the limitations of my educational background. <laughs> uh, th thank you very much for inviting me to uh, sort of join you at this conference this morning. When I, <clears throat> when I landed this morning and you know, the weather was as nice as it was, I said, well, maybe I'll show up and there'll be 10 people. And five minutes into my address, maybe there'll be five people. And then by the time I'm done, there'll be one person, which will have to be Henry. And, uh, but it's very, it's very pleased to be here. Now, I did ask Henry, um, my good friend, I said, what is it I'm supposed to talk about? He said, well, you know, the, the, the topic is uh, biz business perspectives for the next decade. And like every true private equity person that he is, he offered me very little guidance. So I have now taken the liberty of saying, well, if we're going to talk about the next decade, maybe we should take a, a step back and, you know, start with where we've been and see what sort of progress we've made and what lessons does that leave uh, for the future. So I thought I would start with a few remarks about the journey that the African continent has been on since independence in 1960. Now, of course, uh, those of you from Ethiopia will be very quick to point out that actually Ethiopia has declared independence in the fourth century. Those of you from Liberia will say, well, look, Liberia de declared independence in, in, in 1845, actually 47. There are a host of North African countries, uh, Morocco, Egypt, Libya, Sudan, Tunisia, all of whom became independent in the early to mid-50s. And of course, I know there are some Ghanaians in the room, and the first thing they will say is uh, they will accuse me of Nigeria-centric behavior in talking about 1960, because after all, Ghana became independent, the first sub-Saharan country to become independent uh, in 1957. The reason I picked 1960, though, is that 1960 actually turns out to be a, being a very important year in African history, and it really has nothing to do with Nigeria. It has to do with the fact that 17 of the 50-plus countries in Africa actually became independent in, in, 19, in 1960. So from Cameroon to, uh, to, uh, to, to Somalia, uh, all of these countries sort of declare their independence. And you know, it seems to me it's important to look back and say, well, are the lives of most of the people on the continent actually better than they were 50 years ago? 
have we fulfilled the, the, the challenge and the promise of independence on the continent? And I suppose there are many ways you can measure whether, in fact, people's lives are better. Uh, I suppose if you count the freedom to be ruled, misruled, or in some cases oppressed by your own people as opposed to a colonial power, then obviously the answer has to be yes, because uh, you know, just about every country on the continent is now ruled by, 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 by its, its nationals. But I think there are some statistics that should give us pause. In 1960, and I will pick on Nigeria, because uh, you know, at the end of the day, Nigeria can't disown me. I have my green passport, and whatever they can do, they can't get rid of me. If I picked on some other country, they might ban me from coming in or something. Uh, but in 1960, Nigeria's gross domestic product was $4.2 billion. Chile's was also $4.2 billion. South Korea was slightly behind Nigeria, $3.9 billion. Thailand, $2.8 billion. Ireland, $1.9 billion. Nigeria ranks 26th in the, in the world in terms of GDP. South Korea was just behind Nigeria at 29th. Portugal was 32nd in the world. By 1980, Nigeria's GDP had risen to over just over $64 billion. You remember 1980 was the first uh, period of explosion in oil prices. And Nigeria still ranked 27th in the world. South Korea had written, risen to the 28th spot with 60, just under $64 billion. And by 2006, Nigeria had actually dropped to 50th in the world. It had been overtaken by Chile, which was now 40th, Portugal, which was 36th, Ireland, which was 32nd, Thailand, which was 35th, and of course, South Korea, which has now, had now risen to the 14th position. By 2010, South Korea's GDP was over a trillion dollars, just over five times Nigeria's at 200 billion. Thailand, the GDP was one and a half times Nigeria's. And Indonesia, which back in 1960, I was ranked way behind Nigeria, Indonesia's GDP, and Indonesia is fairly comparable to Nigeria. It has a very large population. Uh, it has some resources like Nigeria has. Indonesia's population was, uh, GDP was three times Nigeria's. So you say, well, maybe that's not a fair way of measuring uh, progress. So why don't we do it on GDP per capita, okay? In the period between 1980 and 2010, so 30 years, Nigeria's GDP per capita barely moved from $1,300 in, uh, in 1980 to $1,400 in 2010. South Korea's had gone from $1,700 to $21,000 during the same period. Clearly, the South Koreans have done something right. And when you think about South Korea, it really isn't a country that is blessed with an abundance of resources. Yes, it has you know, industrial people, industrious people. So does Nigeria. It has entrepreneurial people. So does Nigeria. What it doesn't have are you know, the sort of mineral resources, oil, coal, and all the other resources that, that Nigeria has. And so you might say, well, look, this is, that's all about statistics. Uh, that's not a fair measure of, of progress. So why don't we try and define progress by the provision of basic services, you know, clean water, electricity, reliable transport systems, education, healthcare. If you look at any of those measures, I think uh, the, the, the 50 years since, since independence has, uh, the, the, the continent in fact has been a failure. Now there are isolated examples, you know, tiny Botswana has made uh, since very significant progress. South Africa has certainly, certainly done, uh, done very well. But for the most of the majority of African populations, the 50 years of independence has simply not lived up to the promise that, that, uh, of the times. And so the question you have to ask yourselves in, as, you, as you look forward is, where did we go wrong? Uh, and you know, there have been countless books that have been written by economists, by politicians, astrologers, soothsayers, you know, sort of fakes uh, about why you know, the country, uh, these countries and the continent uh, ha have gone wrong. Some blame a steady succession of incompetent governments, whether elected or self-appointed. In some cases, it was ethnic strife that in many cases degenerated into civil wars such as you had in Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Liberia, uh, the Côte d'Ivoire. Endem endemic corruption has certainly been a, a contributing factor. Immature and inadequate institutions, which some blame on the colonial powers as part of some huge conspiracy to make sure that the African continent remained down forever. 
The conspiracy theorists who even being blamed sabotage by uh, foreign interests. And uh, I guess in a book by one of your uh, previous keynote speakers, foreign aid was also blamed as a contributing factor. And I'm sure that all of these things are contributed. And quite frankly, it's very hard to make generalizations uh, on a con about a continent with over a billion people and you know, sort of 50 different countries. But for me, that's really not what's important. What's important is what do we do about it and how do we move forward? And in my judgment, it seems to me there are four very important steps that we can take and continue to take in order to make sure that, we, in fact, we re realize the promise of independence. I think the first and most important one is that we have to continue along the path uh, which, which we've certainly seen emerge on the continent today, where political leaders are really held accountable to the people that they govern. Uh, to this end, I think recent developments in East Africa, some of the developments in North Africa, the changes we've seen in Liberia, the changes we've seen in Ghana, more recent changes in Nigeria, the Côte d'Ivoire, are surely encouraging signs which deserve all of our support and, and, and focus. The era of in unelected presidents for life, or the era of the Gbagbos or the Robert Mugabe's who lose elections and then refuse to go, these people really have to be confined to the rubbish bins of history, which is really where they deserve to be. But these changes will only come about by, with insistence by the governed to hold their political leaders accountable for their mistakes and their successes as well. We can't continue to be indifferent to, 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 to governments that get elected and or, you know, elect themselves and simply fail to deliver. And so we have to be sure that we are looking for competent leadership and we can't blame ignorance we can't blame misguided sentiments about ethnic loyalty, or we can't blame the fact that people get bought off with token sums of money for their votes. Because if we, if we accept all of these things, then we can't rightly complain about the results uh, that, that, that we should see. And I suppose one of the lessons that must be clear from the recent Arab Springs in North Africa and in the Middle East and all these uprisings is that ordinary people can in fact effect change if they wanted badly enough. Hopefully, these are lessons that are not lost on the politicians who, who inhabit the regions south of the, Sahara, of the Sahara. Secondly, I think we must address the failures in the educational systems in most African countries. Secondary school graduates that are ba barely literate, university graduates who can't communicate intelligently, inadequate focus on science, on math, on engineering, on things that really matter Surely, that's not the way we're going to build the Africa of the 21st century. How we make these changes re will require the active engagement of all of us, whether or not we are educational specialists. I think this issue is simply too important to be left to the hands of the experts. And quite frankly, the experts haven't done a particularly good job of it anyway. And what it will do is it will require imagination from governments. It will require imagination from the private sector. One of the most delightful things about the position I, I occupy is that I, I have a steady stream of young Africans who come to see me. And for some reason, they think I have sage advice to offer. But what's fascinating to me is the enthusiasm and the creativity that they bring to the different things they want to do when they go back home. So I had a group of individuals who came to see me to talk about web-based education, how they're going to go back to uh, their home country and set up a web-based learning system. And you know, when I got over the fact, and the, the country they were talking about was Nigeria, and when I asked them about, well, don't you need uh, computers for web-based learning? They said, yes. And don't you need reliable electricity for the computers to run so you can have access to web-based education? They said, yes. And I said, well, I thought you know, the electric system in Nigeria was notoriously unreliable. I said, well, you know, you're being too negative. We're going to go off and we're going to do this. Now, that sort of creativity and that sort of enthusiasm, I think it's important. And I think that's really how we will make the changes in the educational system. I mean, there is good news. Okay? Africa is not the first continent to face this challenge. And there's a lot to be said for learning from the, both the mistakes as well as the successes for others. I think the third thing we need to do is radically rethink the role of government in many countries in Africa. In my judgment, one of the reasons why corruption continues to be an endemic problem on the continent is because of the level of influence that governments, 
retain over economic activity in most of our countries. When government licenses to import petroleum products are the path to riches, it is not a surprise that one of the world's leading oil producing countries can't figure out how to run and build effective refineries. When uh, the license to import diesel, which is what runs generators, is, 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 is the path to riches in, in Nigeria, it's not a surprise that you know, the Nigerian government has spent, you, know, you, you pick your number, 5, 10, 15, 20 billion dollars over the last 10 years on fixing the electric power system problem, and yet we've made no measurable progress. So there are powerful interests who directly benefit from some of these, uh, some of these uh, shortcomings. And maybe it's because I've spent most of my prof professional lives in the private sector and lived most of my professional life in the US. My view is I just don't see any reasons at all why African governments should be involved in co any form of commercial activities. I mean, admittedly, there are countries in the world, Singapore comes to mind, who seem to have mastered the secrets of how to run efficient co commercial enterprises. But so far as I can tell, this is something that continues to elude us on the African continent. And so I just see, we, I think it's, uh, the reasons for, for em embarking on them are, are simply, to me, inex inexplicable. In our own business, which is investing in infrastructure assets, we see countless of exam examples of government-owned businesses that are not efficiently managed. And this is in the advanced countries, where there's a lot more institutional capacity. For example, uh, you know, somebody mentioned that we own airports in London. We own two, Gatwick and City Airport. For each of those airports, we set sort of, uh, sort of standards and criteria in terms of how they must operate efficiently. So for example, a city airport, the, the, the standard is in during peak rush hour periods, nobody sh should spend more than five minutes going through security queues. And during off-peak periods, it shouldn't go, go, take you more than 90 seconds. We set, set standards in terms of how long it takes planes to be turned around when they land at the gates. When we bought the airport, it took an average of 48 minutes. We now have it down to 35 minutes. Our goal is to take it down to 30 minutes. And when you do things like that, you can then improve on-time departures of city airport, which was 65% when we bought it, to 85%. Now, as I got on a plane to come to, uh, come to London last night, I went through Kennedy Airport, for those of you who've been through Kennedy Airport. Uh, sometimes when I fly from Singapore to New York, I wonder which of the two countries is the emerging market country, based on the quality of the airport stock. But I, I have to confess, as I walked through the airport, I didn't see any signs of a real focus on customer service and improving the efficiency of the operations. And of course, Kennedy is a government-owned airport in an advanced country. I think the fourth thing we need to deal with is a problem of Africa's infrastructure. Um, you know, many studies have shown that there is a direct correlation between the state of a country's infrastructure and economic growth. In fact, the World Bank has, has, has sort of done a study which showed that if every country in Africa had infrastructure that was comparable to Mauritania, annual economic growth in, in Africa would grow up by 2% a year. The same World Bank has told the Indians that if India had halfway decent, not decent, halfway decent infrastructure, India's economic growth rates would actually be faster than China's. So it's clear that poor infrastructure not only inhibits economic growth, but quite frankly, it stands in the way and affects the quality of, of the lives of the people on the continent. Now the bank, World Bank estimated is that it, it is, Africa needs to spend something like $90 billion a year on, on infrastructure. Traditional sources, the World Bank itself, governments, can account for somewhere around 40 to 45 billion of that. So which leads a funding gap of $50 billion a year. And the question is, how do we get $50 billion more into African infrastructure? For me, to me, the solution is obvious, which is you've got to involve the private sector. And the, the real question is, well, how exactly do we do this? Well, to me, the changes that have taken place in the telecom sector in Africa offer an illustrative example of what the private sector can do when it is properly engaged. And I'm glad that uh, Mr. Nleko is going to be one of your one of your keynote speakers, because obviously MTN has be, been at the forefront of some of, these, uh, some of these changes. But when you look at from the fact that, you know, telephones in, in, in Africa have gone from being the, uh, shall we say, uh, unreliable preserve of the privilege, 
to sort of near ubiquitous ne necessities where, you know, sort of even taxi drivers and uh, sort of lorry drivers have telephones. I think this provides an inkling of what the private sector can do if it's given the, if it's given the opportunity. So what is it that governments need to do? One, they need to establish very clear, transparent, and balanced regula re regulatory regime. They have to encourage economic pricing. Uh, one of the quite, you know, so one of the issues that often comes up is, well, we can't really afford to have uh, the private sector involved in power generation in Nigeria because they will try charge too much for electricity. Uh, we need to keep the current subsidized rates. Well, what that ignores is the fact that when you look at how electricity is generated in Nigeria, with all the diesel generators that are run at homes and factories, the real cost of electric production is massively more than the cost that's incurred by the government in sort of the power that it supplies. Not to talk about the cost to the economy or the cost to the people of actually not having reliable electric supplies. It seems to me the next thing that the governments need to do is they really have to put out the welcome mat for investment, whether it's from domestic sources or from international sources. You know, Africa needs to recognize that it is in competition for investment capital, okay? And yes, there are some places where you have to go to Africa. If you're looking for oil, you have to go to Nigeria, Ghana, Angola. If you're looking for gold, you have to go to South Africa. But other than in the area of natural resources, where you have to go to where the resources are, there is no particular reason why investment capital has to go to Africa. You're competing with the US, with China, with India, with Brazil, with Europe, all of these other countries. And we have to get over this attitude that somehow, you know, sort of capital owes us uh, the, the responsibility to be, to be on the continent. And we have to make the right choices. Um, I was asked to meet with uh, the late president of Nigeria to talk to him about how to encourage investments in infrastructure in, in Nigeria. And I said, well, as I looked at it, it was very clear that Nigeria actually was not serious about it. And he sort of looked at me and sort of got annoyed and said, what do you mean we're not serious? I said, well, let me give you an example. He said, uh, I said, several years ago, Nigeria decided to privatize their steel company. This is a company that had never made any money and quite frankly had, you know, never been able to operate efficiently. And there are two metals in the world of steel. One is Laxmi Mittal, who runs Asalom Mittal, and there's another one who lives in India. Both sets of metals were interested in buying this steel company. And Nigeria, in its infinite wisdom, chose the wrong metal. And of course, not, not surprisingly, a few years later, you know, there are lawsuits and all sorts of things sort of going on. I said to me, that is a clear example of why people look at you and say, well, you guys aren't serious. Because if you had picked the right metal, if Asola Metal decided they were going to invest, you know, whatever the number is, 100 million, 200 million, 500 million dollars in Nigeria, that has a demonstrable effect on other companies who will then say, well, okay, maybe these Nigerians are really serious, and then you will get serious capital. But in every single case, Nigeria always seems to make the wrong decision. We've been trying to sell our telecom company for at least eight years, nine years, ten years. We've had three different processes, and they always go for the guy with, you know, the thing's probably worth $10 million. I don't know what it's worth, but, you know, $20 million. And some joker shows up and says, well, I'll pay you a billion dollars. And they always go for that guy, and, of course, that guy never has any money, and so they have to cancel it and start all over again. And I say, well, you know, when you do things like that, don't be surprised that people don't think you're serious. So if we're serious, we really have to start to make uh, sort of some, some of the right decisions. So as I look, to, look at it, from roads to bridges, power plants, transmission systems, airports, ports, there really is no reason that I know of that governments have to be involved in the ownership of these assets. The private sector, I believe, can do a much better job of building them. It can do, certainly it can do a better job of operating them, of maintaining them. And, you know, I think to the extent that governments uh, around the continent are serious about addressing the problems of infrastructure, then I think encouraging and enlisting the support of the private sector is one place where I think we can make uh, a lot of difference. Now, of course, there's a whole host of other areas where Africa needs to make progress, whether in order to fulfill the promise of the last 50 years, whether it's in healthcare, in women's rights, in, in security. These are all areas where there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But, you know, it is a bright Saturday morning, and so I shouldn't give you the impression that it's all doom and gloom on the African continent, because I actually don't believe that. Uh, I, I think there are some clear signs that there is progress being made. I mentioned earlier some of the improvements that we're seeing in, in, in on the governance front. 
with freer e elections and democratic changes of government. By and large, all of the economies, or most of the economies in the region are actually experiencing quite uh, significant economic growth, in many cases fueled by the commodity booms, although rising food and fuel prices are raising a new, a new set of challenges for the, uh, the, the continent. Over the last 10 years, foreign direct investment in Africa has gone up more than sixfold, by from $6 billion in, in, to, to over $40 billion, although it still only accounts for 5% of, of global flow, flows. And you, know, you finally know that Africa has arrived <clears throat> when the giants of private equity, you know, the Carlyles and the KKRs of the world, are announcing that they're going to join the pioneers like Helios and Emerging Market Partners and Actis in investing on the African continent. When that happens, then you know, you know that uh, you know, Africa's time has come. So you might ask me then, how does this all relate to you? you know, are these just the musings of uh, sort of a 50-something-year-old person who is stuck in the past as opposed to looking, looking uh, to, to, to the future? In my judgment, each generation of Africans faces a unique set of challenges that defines it. For my grandparents' generation, and for, for, I, guess, for, I guess for most of you in this room, your great-grandparents' generations, it was the struggle for independence. For my parents' generation, the, the, the challenge was to build cohesive nations out of diverse ethnic, cultural uh, tra traditions. For my generation, the challenge was to harness the resources and the people to create the foundations for economic and social progress. And I will be the first to say that my generation has not lived up to that uh, challenge. So it's now on to your generation. Yours is the challenge of rebuilding the Africa of the future so that we can begin to realize the promises of independence and have the continent live up to its true, true potential. You have many, many, many w wonderful tools at your disposal. Quite frankly, tools that we didn't have uh, when, we, when we were coming along. For those of you who are either current students or alumni of uh, the London Business School, you have received the finest in business educations. So what you now must do is you have to combine all of these, the, uh, use all of these tools with the entrepreneurial drive and uncompromising un integrity and a passion for excellence in everything you do and apply all of those skills and all of those talents and all of those capabilities through addressing the, 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 the challenges that the continent uh, faces. You know, to borrow a, a phrase that was used by W.B.E.B. Du Bois in his famous essay, all of you are part of Africa's talented tenth. Much has been given to you and much is expected of you. What remains is to see if, and I hope you do, you rise to, to, that, uh, to that challenge and so that when we gather here 10 years from now, we will look back and say, yes, in fact, we did meet the, the, the task of, of moving Africa forward over the next decade. So thank you, and I'm told I'm supposed to stand here and ask, answer some questions, which I'm happy to do if anybody has questions. And if not, I will slink off. Back. Feel free to ask about anything. It doesn't have to be anything I spoke about. And if you have had a miserable experience at the city airport of Gatwick, feel free to tell me about it as well. Is that working? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so you mentioned two UK investments, which are um, City Airport and Gatwick. Have you made any infrastructure investments in, in Africa, and what was the rationale? Sure. Uh, the question is, have we made inf infrastructure investments in Africa, and what was the rationale? The, no, the unfortunate thing is that we have not made any infrastructure investments in Africa, but we have made emerging market infrastructure investments. So we have an investment in India. We own a petroleum product storage facility in India. And we've made an investment in Argentina. We have uh, well over a quarter of a billion dollars invested in a port and container terminal and logistics business in, in, in Argentina. We have looked at some opportunities in Africa. We have looked at some opportunities in, in Nigeria. And the reasons why we have not made investments in Africa to date are one, uh, 
you know, part of what I sort of meant by, by you know, African governments aren't serious. Um, we've been approached numerous times, uh, especially since this article sort of showed up that seemed to pretend that I personally own Gatwick Airport, which I don't. <laughs> um, um, to, I mean, we've been asked about investing in sort of airports on the African continent, which we'd be interested in doing. But then, you know, you sort of have one meeting and the minister says, oh, it's a great idea. So you have to meet my president, so you meet the president, the president says it's a great idea, and then sort of nothing happens, and so six months later, you know, uh, sort of everything dies. So to me, if, if, if African governments are serious about uh, encouraging investments in their infrastructure, they really have to behave as if they are. Uh, and so far, there's, you know, there's marked little evidence that I've seen anyway that there is a commitment, a seriousness, uh, an acceptance of the fact that you know, turning over responsibility of some of these assets to the private sector sort of makes sense. The second reason why we've not made a lot of investments in, in Africa is most of the investments tend to be small. Uh, you know, our fund is just under $6 billion. And so to invest $50 million or $100 million in an airport really is not, you know, because even, even if it's a huge success, it really still doesn't make a difference in terms of the overall returns that, that the fund, uh, the fund uh, generates. We prefer to invest, make investments where our investment is half a billion dollars, $600 million, and you, you don't see a lot of those kinds of opportunities on, on the continent. And then the, th the third reason is many of the infrastructure investment opportunities in, in, in Africa are really greenfield, you know, building new power plants, building new transmission lines. Uh, our current fund doesn't really do greenfield investments, but one of the things that we certainly would intend to do is at some point we will raise a fund that focuses on emerging market investments and then we will certainly ex expect and hope to make investments in, 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 in Africa. Um, you mentioned a few things about Nigeria. I'm Nigerian, and you mentioned that um, the Nigerian government it isn't, isn't serious. Um, I might slightly disagree with you on that, purely because um, there are certain, um, citing the Virgin Atlantic Nigeria Airways partnership, so we did look in the right direction. Um, I, I think you were a bit um, uh, politically, well, maybe not politically correct, but. Uh, but you were trying to, I, I think the biggest issue with Africa is corruption. Um, and it's the fact that the governments are corrupt. That's why we haven't been able to make progress. Um, what I would like to know is, uh, are you and maybe some of the organizations that you are associated with, are you doing anything to ensure that the next generation of Nigerians can actually scale that, that barrier uh, to get better involved, to become more selfless? Um, the biggest issue with Africa, like I said, is corruption and the fact that um, the next generation of leaders are not particularly here. They are back in Nigeria and they're the ones that are being tutored by the corrupt government. So it's kind of like the corrupt handing over to the corrupt. How can we break this cycle and what can we do to ensure that we actually do something positive since we are the next generation? Thank you. Yeah, I, I actually don't agree. I, I don't think the biggest problem with Africa is corruption, uh, I, at least in terms of achieving meaningful economic and social progress. You know, China is not without corruption. Korea is not without corruption. India certainly is not without corruption. Indonesia is not without corruption. Malaysia is not without corruption. Argentina is not without corruption. Brazil is not without corruption. Yet these are all emerging market countries that have made very, very substantial progress in dealing with and providing much better economic, social, and, and sort of business environments. So I, I, I think corruption is, is a symptom, but I don't th really think it's, a root, it's, a, it's a root of, a root, the root of the problem. Uh, I, I think part of the, the, the most significant problem is uh, a sort of a failure of accountability for our political leaders, okay? Uh, you know, I'm not a politician, and you know, I'm sure there'll be somebody in here who will go back and tell the government that I, you know, the bios gave a speech and he said, how can you have a party that has ruled Nigeria for the last, what, how long has the PDP been there? 14 years, 15 years, 16 years? Has delivered very little in the way of measurable results, and he keeps getting reelected. 
You know, what, what kind of, you know, it's not a surprise that they continue to behave the same way that they do because it's clear that people don't seem to care, right? If you throw the rascals out, right, and then insist on seeing results, then I think you will, you will see a sort of fundamental change. And in terms of, you know, you know, I don't think Africans are, you know, sort of constitutionally corrupt, certainly not any, they're not any different from any of the other peoples around the world. The environment in which they operate affects them. Uh, I think some of you are the leaders of, 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 of Africa for tomorrow, whether, whether you do it in political spheres or you do it in economic spheres or in business spheres or in social spheres. And I think the question you have to ask yourself is, at the end of the day, you have to live with yourself, okay? And you know, if you achieve, if you attain success, combine that with integrity. Let there be some things that you just refuse to do because it is not what the type of person that you are. And I think that everybody is capable of that. I mean, people know what's right and they know what's wrong. And so, I, you know, I don't sort of buy this notion that somehow there's something about the African, uh, the African um, uh, psyche that is different from anybody else in the world. And by the way, you know, half of the Europeans and the Americans who turn up on the continent behave exactly the same way. So it can't be, certainly can't be endemic to these people. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the environment. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be here. Sorry. See, I knew that.